All right. This is Gist of the Bible, Lesson 21. This series of lessons was written by Marion Fox and is taught by me. Today, I want to look over here about the spiritual kingdom here. Uh, that's where we ended it last time. Now we want to look at the third promise uh, made to Abraham, and it was a land promise. And we find that in Genesis 12, and verse 1, and verses 6 and 7. Often when people are studying Genesis, they want to go right to Abraham, and they'll go right to around Genesis 12. A lot of information picks up there. The Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. So we have this land promise. Now, where was this land located? Can he pull out a map? Canaan. Yeah, yeah, we know after the fact, but when he's told this, did he know where? It's still a mystery. So many people call this going without knowing. And many would say, well, there's some faith involved. God says, go. And what does he do? Go. He goes, he went, he followed the Lord. And so go from your country. How hard would it be to change countries? Now we've have folks here, you change countries. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard. I hear folks here when they come from another country here, there's so many things that are different from their own country. Some say the, it's the food that's different. The laws are different. But often it's some kind of cultural things, this unwritten things that they pick up on later. Wait till your in-laws get here. Wait till my in-laws get here. Yeah, they're from another country. That's that's uh, it's different. They handle things differently. Um, in fact, over there, I, I used to joke with Joanna, we'd go, you know, when we stand in line, it's single file. It's how we're taught from a young age. Over there, a line is like a crowd. And and that's they just kind of all form this semicircle around. That's their line. And now the person who's checking people in believes that that, that one believes he knows which one's next. They 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 think that's how they know that they're getting the right order, but they don't uh, uh, for sure. But there are some cultural differences. Maybe there's some protections you had in your own country that you don't have in your in another place. Maybe your family's here. You've got security. You know this. Well, this, he's saying go from this country. Now go from your people. Well, that's another big thing. You're used to being around family. Now, it seems like recent years we moved further and further apart, but a lot of folks stay in the same area. But leave your people and even more specifically, your father's household. You're going to get you're going to go out here alone to this land. I'm going to show you. That's a big challenge here. Verse 6 says, Abram traveled through the land as far as the side of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. So there he said, this land. Now there's a little bit of issue with this land promise. Here's this land. What do you do with this land? What's the problem with this land that he's going to, he has on promise that's Canaan here? Occupied. Is occupied. Yeah, it's occupied. That can be an issue, but is it an issue for God? Not for God. But they're going to have to wonder, what do we do about this? But he's here going on faith. So there's this land promise that's given. This was probably the fulfillment of the curse upon Ham, we find through his son Canaan, Genesis 9, verse 20, 24 through 27. The Noah awoke from his wine and knew that his youngest son, uh, what his youngest son had done to him. So he said, curse be Canaan. Uh, a servant of servants, he shall be to his brothers. And he said, blessed be Yahweh, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem and let Canaan be his servant. Genesis 9, 24. So we're going to see here, this is that area. The curse was upon Canaan. And that this and his descendants would serve both Shem and Japheth. And a lot of people take this scripture here and they think it's a curse upon people with dark skin or black people. And But it says here it's upon Canaan, the father of the Canaanites here. The curse was fulfilled when Israel occupied the land of Canaan. Some have grossly misinterpreted this passage to make it teach that God intended for Ham's descendants to be slaves. And that's not what we see uh, through here. There was a punishment for something that had taken place. The curse was upon Ham, uh, not upon Ham, but upon Canaan. It's obvious that Canaan is named when his posterity is meant. It's a synecdoche, meaning one part represents the whole. It's likely that Ham was wicked in what he did with his father, Noah, and that this wickedness was transferred by his lack of teaching of Canaan and by his bad example. Now, Ezekiel 18.20 should be a familiar passage, but it's a soul that sins, it will die. 
uh, we don't pay for the sins of our father. The son doesn't pay for the sins of the father here, uh, spiritually speaking. Let's go a little further here. The Ammonites were cast out when their iniquity was full. Then in the fourth generation, they will return here for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. Genesis 15, 16. What's it mean that the iniquity was not yet complete? What does that mean for God? They weren't through sinning. These, these people were still sinning. They had opportunity still to change and to repent. They still had an opportunity. The Amorites were descendants of Canaan, Genesis 10, 15 through 18. God who knows the future did not cast them out, make them slaves to Shem's descendants, the Israelites, until their iniquity was full. It was something they had, they had brought upon themselves. The Amorites are put by way of synecdoche for all the Canaanites, and this is proven by the words of Nehemiah. This is chapter 9. You are Yahweh God who chose Abram and brought him out from Ur of the Chaldees and gave him the name Abraham. You found his heart faithful before you and cut a covenant with him to give him the land of the Canaanite, of the Hittite, of the Amorite, of the Perizzite, the Jebusite, the Girgashite, to give it to his seed, and you have established your promise, for you are righteous. The Canaanites were not punished for the sins of Ham, but for their own sins. Amen. Ezekiel 18, 20, the soul whose sins will die, the son will not bear the iniquity of the father, nor will the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous will be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked will be upon himself. They each paid for their own sin here. It wasn't something that inherited down, but the teaching is often what does it. When the father doesn't teach the son and it goes right on down and there's this culture of evil that prevails. Uh, we see that in nations. After Lot and Abram were separated, God renewed his promise to Abraham. We find this in Genesis 13. Remember, we started Genesis 12. Now we're uh, Genesis 13. The Lord said to Abram after Lot had departed from him, Look around from where you are to the north and south, to the east and west. All the land that you see, I will give to you and your offspring forever. Now, God established the boundaries in Genesis 15, 18. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said to your descendants, I give this land from the Wadi of Egypt to the great river of the Euphrates. So there's some boundaries here that God is saying, this is the land uh, that I'm going to give you. That's the land promise here. God promised Abraham all the land of Canaan, Genesis 17, 8. The whole land of Canaan, where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. So here we see even more this land promise that's given here to Abraham. Now, Abraham at this time, it says here, he's living here in 17, verse 8. He's living as a foreigner, a foreigner. He's the stranger in the land at this point. He's the one that looks out of place. God said, this is part of this land. This is the land that I'm going to give you. Well, this promise was also made to Isaac. Genesis 26, verses 3 through 5. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and to your seed, I give all these lands, and I will establish the oath which I swore to your father Abraham, and I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven. And I will give your seed all these lands, and by your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because Abraham listened to my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Now, is Isaac benefiting from this land promise here? Is is it how is it how is it that it gets going to get passed to him now? Saying this goes back to Abraham. This goes back to his father here. And his faithfulness, he listened to my voice. What if Abraham never listened when God said, leave this land? Leave your father's family. What if he never listened and he just stayed put? Uh, archaeologists tell us that where he was at, or the Chaldeans, was a very uh, well-to-do society. It was built up. It would be a great place to live as far as having a society around you, a place to work and be around other people. It was quite advanced for the time. Now he's going somewhere else. It might be hard to leave your culture and your family, but he listened. God also promised the land of Canaan to Jacob and his descendants. So we're following down here to Genesis 28. 
sojourn in this land and I will be with you and bless you for to you and to your seed. I will give all these lands and I will establish the oath which I swore to your father Abraham. And I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven. And I will give your seed all these lands and by your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because Abraham listened to my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. A little bit further, Genesis 26, verse 13. And the man became great and continued to grow greater until he became very great. And he had possessions of flocks, possessions of herds, many servants of the Philistines were jealous of him. So now we have the Philistines here. They're looking over here at this, this people that have grown. And they're being blessed and they're thinking, man, have you ever looked at someone who had it all and just kind of felt jealous? Hopefully as Christians, we can put that behind us and not deal with that. But the Philistine people were looking, wow, look at all that he has. Plan travel here and I will be with you and I will be and I will bless you. One of the principles of scripture is the greater uh, blesses the lesser here. God is the one who is giving the blessing. And he goes back to your seed. I will give all these lands and I will establish the oath which I swore to your father Abraham. So every time this is repeated here, we're seeing this repetition. This is that oath. This is that promise that was given back in the days of Abraham. And we see this blessing here. And interesting, I'm going to multiply your seed as the stars of heaven. Now, that's just a way of saying a great number. Now, at some points in time, people have claimed to have counted every star. That's happened throughout history. That they, oh, we've got them all numbered. There's 300 of them. We've got them all numbered. We put a name on it. Several years ago, I uh, commercials on television that if you wanted to give your loved one something special, you could name a star after them for the low cost of whatever it was, you know. $40, whatever. I'm sure that star got so many names, you know, and who's going to, who's going to know, you know, they're just talking with somebody uh, there, but it's a way of saying a great number. Uh, the stars of heaven today, we would not even dream. We know how many there are uh, because every time we get a better telescope, uh, we look, Oh, there's some more. We see some more. Oh, there was a dim one. It's brighter now. It's something we don't even bother trying to do anymore. So it's a way of saying there's going to be, a great number of people. And even at this point, it says the man became great and continued to grow greater until he became very great. So we have these great, greater, and very great, uh, these comparatives here that he is he's being blessed here to the point that even the neighbors there, the Philistines, are jealous of him. So we see this being fulfilled through here. God told Moses that he was fulfilling this promise in the time of Moses, Exodus 33, uh, and verses 1 and 2, and Deuteronomy 34, verse 4. Then Yahweh spoke to Moses, go, go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up from the land of Egypt to the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, to your seed I will give it, and I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jezubite. Now, we talked about the issue here that this land is promised here, but the problem is, well, somebody already lives here. Well, God's going to take care of that, that issue here, and God has the ability to do it. Here, I'm going to send an angel. Angels, now, when we think about angels, we have to look at the context. Is it a heavenly angel, or earthly angel? Angel means messenger. But when we see something powerful like this, we say that's, that's probably a, a heavenly angel. We have an example of one angel killing 185,000 people. So angels are powerful, and an angel would have the power to do this. So I'm going to send an angel before you. Let's look at Deuteronomy 34.4. Then Yahweh said to him, This is the land which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, I will give it to your seed. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not go over there. So he's seeing this, but someone had to stay behind. Remember who that had to be? Moses, Moses had to stay behind. It, it goes back to where he was disobedient early on. But this promise was still fulfilled. He could see it, uh, couldn't go over. Now, a little bit further, we'll look. The land promise given to both Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was fulfilled. And we see this is fulfilled in the scripture. The promise is made. 
we see it happening where the people become greater and greater and greater still. And we're going to see this being fulfilled. It's taking place. We see God say, I'm going to send an angel to make sure uh, that this land will be ready for you. But sometimes you can bless people too much at once and they can't handle that blessing. But God doesn't do that. He knows what people need and he's going to bless them as they need it. Uh, and we see that here. God gave Israel all the land that he swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is Joshua 21 and verse 43. So the Lord gave Israel all the land he had sworn to give their ancestors, and they took possession of it and settled there. So was this promise given back in the days of Abraham totally fulfilled? We see here, he gave all the land that he had sworn to give their ancestors. He has done it. God is faithful. Every good thing that God promised Israel came to pass. Here's Joshua 23, 14. Now I'm about to go the way of all the earth. What's he saying here? He's going to die. Uh, I'm about to go the way of all the earth. We're all going to die unless the Lord comes before that. He knows his time is coming. We might have other ways of saying that today. Uh, but he says, I'm about to go the way of all the earth. We're all going to die one day says, you know, with all your heart and soul that not one of all the good promises the Lord your God gave you, every promise has been fulfilled, not one has failed. He's saying, when you look back at all the things God has promised, and you go back and look at that promise back in the days of Abraham and, and his son and the son after him, and we look at the increase that is given and here in the days of Joshua, he's about to pass away. Uh, a lot of conquering has taken over. They're occupying the land. And he says, I'm about to die. But I want you to remember, God was faithful to keep all these promises that he said he was going to keep. Not one of them has failed. Can God's promises fail if we are faithful to obey him? If God promises it, it's going to be it's going to come true. Uh, God is powerful enough to make sure that those things will take place. He said, every promise has been fulfilled. Not one has failed. Maybe in our own lives, we might stop and look back at the things that we have asked God and prayed about and, and look back and say, you know, God did get me through that rough spot. He helped me through that. And the Lord uh, has been a blessing to me. And we can look and see it. Here, he's looking specifically at promises that were made uh, about the land. And he says, you know, all those things the Lord has promised, they've all been fulfilled. And he says, what a good God that is. Now, when we look back, we're talking about Joshua, who, who really trained a lot under Moses. Was Joshua a pretty faithful fella? <coughs> yeah, yeah. Him, him and who was his sidekick that was faithful? You remember his name? David. Caleb, Caleb and Joshua, they were faithful from a young age and really kept their faith in God. Now he's about to pass. This is a note of encouragement to the people here. Hey, trust God, be faithful to him because everything he promised has come to pass. What a good God that we have. Solomon ruled over all the land uh, that God promised to Israel. This is 2 Chronicles 9.26. He ruled over all the kings from the Euphrates River to the land of the Philistines as far as the border of Egypt. He did this. Now, the claim of the premillennial teacher that this promise was to be filled in the future is false here. It was fulfilled right here. Some are still looking for this promise, but it was fulfilled. It has come to, it's already come to pass. The extent and security of the kingdom here we see here in 1 Kings 4, 21, verse 24, uh, 20, 25, and 2 Chronicles 9, and verse 26. We see the fulfillment of Jacob's descendants being as the sand of the sea being fulfilled. We had the description of the stars in heaven. We said we just can't number that. Could you imagine being put on the task of counting the sea, the, the sand on the shore? If you had an hourglass and someone just asked you to count the grains in an hourglass, that would just drive us batty right there. I just know I would I could be meticulous and get it, and I'd probably sneeze and you know they'd all be gone. It's something 
is something showing a large number, that they have been blessed with such a large number as the sand on the seashore, and your seed shall possess the, the gate of their enemies. What's it saying that they're going to possess the gate? What's the benefit of having the gate of your enemies? What is that? Well, it's, they're giving, they're going to rule. The gate's what gets you in. You've got the gate. You've got the whole place. They, they've got it all. So this land that was possessed by this people, God foreknew that they were not going to be faithful. They had a time to repent and to change, but they didn't. Because of their sin, that, that land was taken and given here uh, to Abraham's descendants. Genesis 32 and verse 12. But you have said, I will surely make you prosper and will make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. We just know it can't be counted. We can measure it by the pound uh, and do our best and get pretty close. But we, we could not even, uh, we wouldn't even have the capacity to measure all the sand in the world. It'd just be a guess at the best. We just can't do it. We can put some in a box and weigh it, but we can't even come close to figuring it out. But it's a way of saying this blessing is going to be so great. You just can't even imagine how how many people, how numerous your people will be. And here their borders had been extended. The extent and security of the kingdom here, we see this being fulfilled in the days of Solomon. First Kings 4.20, Judah and Israel were as numerous and multitude. So they had their numbers, people, but... Did they really enjoy that blessing? Was it really a blessing to have that many people or were they starving to death? Or was it a painful time? It says, eating and drinking and rejoicing. They were blessed by God. And remember the days of Solomon. With Solomon, we had the first king of Israel, who was Saul. And then we had King David. And then we had his son Solomon. Was Solomon considered a good ruler in a general sense? He started out very well. He was not perfect. He had some failings, but we remember him as a good ruler, mind by, and he ruled during the time of the United Kingdom. Uh, it was before the split, but after Solomon died, there was a split, and then you had two kingdoms there, the divided kingdom. But here in Solomon's day, that was really a time of, of blessing for the people. It was a time of prosperity. We might even look in our own country and look back and say, you know, those days were great days. Uh, we didn't worry about war. We didn't worry about our enemies. There wasn't sickness. There was plenty of food. We didn't worry about our security. We look, yeah, that was a great time to be alive. Uh, and there's other time we look in our history, you know, that was really a rough time for us. We were so worried about uh, terrorists or we were worried about the economy. People were losing their jobs and they were on the street. We look back to the Depression era. In Oklahoma, we look back to the time of the Dust Bowl. And think about how many people were out of work uh, uh, and how rough that was. And we still have stories of that where people, uh, they just had to move on. Some went over to California in search of gold and better life. Or it was even a town, I think it's still there, a town called Okieville. And that was a derogatory name for a person. All those a bunch of Okies. Uh, and that's, they, they called them bad things. Uh, that was a derogatory thing. But here it was a time of great rejoicing. They had security. Uh, they had wealth. They had, a, it was a great time to be alive for them. But we see here, Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sand by the sea and multitude, eating and drinking and rejoicing. It wasn't just that they had a lot of people. They had it good. It was a good life for them. It was a strong country. And it's a figure of speech speaking. They had a lot of people. It was very numerous, and they were strong, and they had food, they had drink, and they rejoiced. They weren't worried about their enemies. They were able to keep them at bay by, uh, by and large. It was a great time. So it was a great time of peace for them and security. It was a blessing. Now, Shalemezer, king of Assyria, wanted the people of Jerusalem to surrender. Therefore, he promised them safety and peace. You know, in some of these battles, we had Assyria. And Assyria was a powerful nation in their time when they were coming and battling against Israel. We get the divided kingdom and they're coming after Israel, the, the 10 northern tribes. And Assyria was a nation to be feared. 
and they were not a very well-liked nation. If we think back to the time of Jonah, the reluctant prophet, he's told to go to Nineveh. You know where Nineveh is? Assyria. I don't want to go to them people. Just destroy them. They're terrible people. And they were a powerful force. When Judah was cursed, there were no grapes or figs. Jeremiah 8.13. Uh, I will take away their harvest, declares the Lord. There'll be no grapes on the vine. There'll be no figs on the tree. Their leaves will wither. What I have given them will be taken from them. Why would the Lord take away their harvest? We read about them having, they were rejoicing. They had food, they had drink, but now things have changed. People weren't faithful to the Lord. He said, I'm going to take that away. I'm going to take away those grapes. I'm going to take away that vine. I'm going to take away those figs. The food supply is going, to, it's going to wither. In the time of Messiah, God's people would invite their neighbors under the vine and, and fig tree. As Zechariah 3.10. And that day, each of you will invite your neighbor to send under your vine and, and fig tree, declares the Lord Almighty. From Zechariah's time, it was a prophecy in the future. And when you're saying something like that, what a blessing that you have your own produce. You've got your own crops there. What a time to rejoice again. Well, Israel forfeited the land because of disobedience. Deuteronomy uh, chapter 30, verses 1 through 5, tell us that this was a conditional uh, promise here. And here's verses 2 and 3. And when you and your children return to the Lord your God and obey him with all of your heart, with all of your soul, according to everything I command you today, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where he scattered you. So this is back in the time of Deuteronomy. This hadn't happened yet. He said, now when you turn back with your whole heart, you and your children, your whole heart, your whole soul, what he's saying, he wants more than half-hearted devotion. When you finally do that, and you turn back, and, and uh, he says, the Lord, I will restore your fortunes, and I'll have compassion on you, and gather you again from those nations where they've been scattered. How were they scattered? Well, powerful nations like Assyria coming in and taking over town after town, city after city. Uh, they were taking them, taking them captive. Later, we have Babylon coming in, and they were going down and taking people captive and scattering them all around. Their captivity would turn. Deuteronomy 30 and verse 3 will be discussed later in this lesson. Israel has promised curses for failing to serve God, Deuteronomy 14. With you alone, I'm cutting this cup with this oath, but both with those who stand with us here today in the presence of Yahweh our God and with those who are not with us here today. For you know how we lived in the land of Egypt and how we came through the midst of the nations through which you passed. Moreover, you've seen these things. And we can go through this scripture here and see that this came down that they were not following God, that they forsook the covenant with Yahweh, their God. And part of that, they would worship idols. They were turning away from them. They didn't keep their faith in God. Now, if Israel repented while in captivity, God would bless them again. He would turn their captivity. If they were removed from the land, God would restore them. If they would repent. When all these and curses I've set before you come on you and take them to heart whenever the Lord your God disperses you among the nations. And when you and your children return to the Lord your God and obey him with all of your heart, with all of your soul, according to everything I command you today, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where he scattered you. Even if you have been banished to the most distant land under the heavens, from there, the Lord your God will gather you and bring you back. He will bring you to the land that belonged to your ancestors, and you will take possession of it. He will make you more prosperous and numerous than your ancestors. So from that time when they would be taken captive, it would look bleak. They would look back at the good old days and think, we're never going to have that again. But God says, no, that blessing can still return if you will turn back. Can you think of another person that we look at in the scriptures who, who, who was blessed richly who seemed to have it all and then lost it all 
Job. And he, in the end, he was blessed more than the beginning. So we see God has the power to do this if they would repent, if they would turn back. So this was a conditional promise. Their captivity would turn Deuteronomy 30, verse 3. Uh, there was a circumcision of heart with their associated with their return. That means they they try they quit being hard-hearted to God and his word. The Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants so that you may love him with all your heart and with all your soul and live. Uh, this is also discussed in Romans 2.29. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by the written code such as a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. He's saying here, these folks maybe had the right dress. Maybe they were circumcised. Maybe they were obeying these things outwardly, but their heart was hard towards God. And often that invited them in to do things, accepting what the other nations were doing. And they were letting sin get into their lives. We see later in history that when the people were in Babylonian captivity, uh, that they repented. Nehemiah 1, verses 6 through 9. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself, and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Now, can you look at that prayer? He is so repentant. I'm sorry for what I've done and my fathers have done and, and all these people in my family have done. We're wicked, but please forgive us. We need your blessing. Verse 8, remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your people, your exiled people are the farthest at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Now, at this point, this is being prayed here. He's far away from home. He's under the rule of Babylon, and he's praying that, Lord, let us go back. Now, if you know history, you know the scriptures. Did the people that were captive, the Jewish people in Babylon, were they allowed to go back at some point? They were in fact, history tells us that Babylon, when we talked about the Assyrians being a powerful nation, they were conquered by the Babylonians, who was a very powerful, brutal nation. Well, they were taken over by the Medes and the Persians. And God so put it on the leader's heart to let them go back and even help finance the return of the Jewish people if they so wanted to go back. So the Lord did allow them to go back. Their leaders confessed their sins, but some of the people had not truly repented. Uh, this scattering was a punishment for their sins, and Nehemiah writes a prophecy of future return. And we know that that came true. And the days of Malachi, God exhorted them to return, Malachi 3.7. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? That's the right question for these people at this time here. This was after the return from Babylonian captivity, and this must be a reference to a future return. That'll be covered in the, another series of lessons. We'll go just a little bit further here. Uh, God's promises and warnings with regard to Israel's possession of the land. And I think this is probably a good go ahead and stop at this point and uh, conclude our lesson here. This next one's fairly long. So we'll go ahead and stop that right here.